Greg, really, really good to see you in person. David, great to see you and, and thank you for inviting me on. So we've spoken a couple of times, you've been on the channel a couple of times on Zoom. We first met during COVID, I think probably quite soon after the George Floyd incident and that kind of incredibly heightened tensions over the question of race in America. Right. And I'm really drawn to your work because you combine so many of the different topics that we've talked about. You're, you're a scholar of, of the topic of race, coming from a perspective of developmental thinking, and there's almost no topic that's more polarized and charged than the topic of race in America. And you've also got this fascinating connection to jazz and to the kind of deep history of American black music and the flow states and the kind of the, the kind of embodied piece as well. So really pleased that we can explore this together. And is there anything that you'd like to add to that little intro? Well, um, specifically that I'm the head of the Jazz Leadership Project, um, CEO and I, with my partner and wife, Jewel Kinch Thomas, who's COO. And um, we use the praxis, you know, the, the principles and practices of jazz in action um, and apply it to leadership and team development, team synergy and cohesion. And um, it's a very powerful model for, for leadership and team development. So I think it's important to mention that because somehow, some way we have to find ways to work together um, to deal with the predicament of this meta crisis. And with the, such, a, such a topic that's um, so huge, where, where do you even start, do you think? In terms of race? Um, by pointing out that <laughs> it is a way that, particularly in the West, last 400 or so years, um, that race has been used as a way to divide people into groups and subgroups and to then hierarchically group them um, based on outer characteristics and, and attributes that are put to those characteristics, you know, skin color, size of your nose, shape of your head, <laughs> and stuff like that. But then say that those things point to other qualities and attributes. And in the United States, uh, since the, the late 1600s, it was codified in law, these distinctions based on skin color and that type of thing. Um, so I, th I think adding racialization, which is the process through which groups are sorted into races, is very important to understand. That's, that's one thing. But I think it's also important to, to realize that it's bullshit. <laughs> that when I look at you, uh, first of all, the white and black is a misnomer, my, my mentor. Uh, Albert Murray says that, you know, any fool could see that, you know, so-called white people are not actually white and so-called black people are not actually black in terms of the, the, the color. Um, but what does that mean beyond that? Does that mean anything about your intelligence, your character, what your interests are, uh, what part of the world you come from? I might be able to get an idea of what part of the world you come from, but I don't, I don't actually know until I hear you speak. So when I hear you speak, oh, he's a Brit, you know? But when I hear Idris Elba speak, he's also a Brit. He just happens to be a black Brit. So um, the biological definition and essentialization of race is nonsense, is BS, but that's been known for a long time. But I think it's also important to not just accept the idea that race is a social construct either. Certainly a case can be made and has been made that it's a social construct. But I think if we're gonna move beyond the hold of race, racialization, which both exist under kind of a racial worldview, a way of seeing and being in the world and acting upon seeing and being in the world through a racial lens, that we're gonna even have to challenge the social construction of race. So I think 
adding racialization is one thing. Another is making clear distinctions among race, culture, heritage, and ancestry, etc. There, there are clear distinctions um, between and among those things. And if we had clarity about those distinctions, then we wouldn't fall into so many of the traps that race and racialization um, brings forth. And that turns into racism, which is the mistreatment or differential treatment of people based on those ex external um, selected characteristics and the sorting and the attribution of those things. To, as on a personal level, so you can have an attitudinal um, racism, you know, I see you, he has light skin or he has, you know, pink skin. He's marked as white. Therefore, you have privilege. Therefore, you are an oppressor. I mean, this is, this stuff is just incredible. It takes away any sense of individuality, which is one of the foundational principles of modernity and liberal democracy that we have to uh, embrace. So individuality is really key. So there are individuals who can be racist. They're, particularly when the, the, the social structure and the legal structures are set up in a way where you have, of course, enslavement and Jim Crow, um, you will have groups of people who are, are racist. And then there's the whole issue of systemic racism, which I prefer to say systemic bias. I think there are biases, um, but those biases are not just about race. You know, class is a real strong dimension. There's a whole difference. I know one of the things that the activists say is that, you know, if a cop stops someone on the street and they're black, um, it's not going to make a difference whether they're um, a, you know, a millionaire or this or that. Well, if it goes to court, it will make a difference. <laughs> you know what I mean? I mean, so there's this, there's a fuller dimensionality to life. You mentioned the, the tensions and the different kind of ways of looking at this topic. And I guess at the moment, certainly up until, it feels like a little bit of the, 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 the tide is turning a little bit, but some of the most kind of popular views, most influential views recently have been people like Robin DiAngelo and White Fragility, uh, Kendi, Ibram X. Kendi, and, um, and his kind of concept of being an anti-racist. And I know that your kind of intellectual tradition is very different. You talk about Albert Murray, Ralph Ellison. The thinkers that, and the lineage that I come from, um, a black American intellectual and philosophical tradition that is based in the culture, uh, a blues idiom culture, it's much more capacious. It's much more embracing of the true pluralism and diversity of our Western and American heritage. And it takes a look at the black American cultural contribution to the overall American cultural um, force that, that's been present and is currently present. And it says, you know, there are lessons from that tradition, not only for people who are identified as black, but for all Americans and for the world. So it takes a, a, the blues. See, one of the things that's very powerful about uh, what I call the Ellison Murray continuum, which by the way, for me, the, the blues idiom tradition, which is a term that Albert Murray coined, starts with Frederick Douglass and Harriet Tubman. And then you, you have people like Elaine Locke, who's like the father of the Negro, um, the, the um, Harlem Renaissance, uh, editor of the book, uh, The New Negro, that collection. And Zora Neale Hurston uh, are, are part of the same lineage, which I think Ellison and Murray are in the center in, and their work came about from the 50s uh, on through the 2000s, uh, if you put them together. But also people like Stanley Crouch, Wynton Marsalis, Charles Johnson, Danielle Allen, and Harvard. I put all of them in this tradition. So in any event, it takes a look at, well, what comes from a people? 
I mean, people who are identified as black in America, black Americans ethnically and culturally, are not just the sum of our degradation and our brutalization. We have created, based on the predicament that we had to go through, ways of seeing and being in the world. Um, ways of looking at life that Ellison called a tragic comic perspective and sensibility, where it's not just a tragic awareness that life can be absurd and that death could come at any time, which you need, but also to even laugh at the absurdity. Without that, it's like you might as well just, you know, commit suicide or something. So a tragic comic sensibility is an important aspect of the blues idiom in that perspective. But also um, a tragic optimism. This is a term that, you know, Viktor Frankl, Man's Search for Meaning, um, employed, but also Stanley Crouch. So again, you look at the tragedy of life, the reality of um, man's inhumanity to men, women, and children, and other. <laughs> But you say, you know something? We still need to swing. We still need to do what we have to do every day. Get up to do your best. Strive for excellence. Strive for excellence in your morality. You know, in the intro, we talk about lines of development. Strive for excellence in your moral stances. Strive for excellence in your, your interpersonal relationships. Strive for excellence in your skill set professionally so that you can be your best to play jazz, which is the most, um, the best exemplification for what Murray called the fully orchestrated blues statement. Um, you've got to really know how to play and sing well to be able to stang, to be on that bandstand. So um, this, this way of seeing and being in the world is one that incorporates the individual uh, agency and autonomy that you know a, a great musician, jazz musician, has to develop your chops. You know, learning the forms of the tunes and the scales and the chords, and then practicing improvisation on the bandstand with others. And so, it's a metaphor for how we, as Western people, American citizens, can collaborate and work together, but it's really grounded in some fundamental principles and practices and excellence is a key aspect of it. And I mean, w when do you hear uh, Ibram X. Kendi or, or Robin D'Angelo mention a word like excellence? You know, this, this real, sh this, I say it's an overemphasis on race, not because race isn't an important topic, but because it's so narrow, our lives are so much richer and have fuller dimensions than just race. That's why there are many who are saying, look, you ain't gotta be a Marxist to, to say this and think this. We, got, we have to look at class. We have to look at people's social and economic position in the world and how that constrains what in sociology they call their life chances. It's not just about race, because many of the things that impact disproportionately on people who are racialized as black impact other people too who are not racialized as black so if these are problems and predicaments beyond just the racial category then to have a fuller more integrated perspective we have to look at those dimensions so um just to sum up as far as ellison and murray you know these were two of the greatest writers and thinkers on American culture and black American experience um, of the 20th century into the 21st century. And they did it by being deep, deep high modernists, by which I mean it was the literary high modernism. Uh, but they, they, they studied the history of, of, of myth, of theater, of dance, of music, and it gave them an ability to, with that deep well of knowledge, 
to look at their own, the, the culture developed by their own people and compare and contrast and say how it's a continuation, but also what's distinctive about it. You know, so it's a much more capacious, it's, it's wider, it's deeper, it's, you know, it's, it's so much more profound. And I'm, I'm biased, I'm biased in favor of it, but there's, there are budding movements um, that are in motion where people are, are embracing what Albert Murray called an omni-American identity. That's the title of his first book, The Omni-Americans. Um, I'm involved in several projects of working with different groups of people to be against illiberalism, against bigotry, but for, you gotta say what you're for too, but for an omni-American future, um, for a vision that embraces our similarities and the foundation of, of a shared social contract that in America derives from the Constitution, Bill of Rights, Declaration of Independence. Um, but also, what are our differences? But not to allow those differences to divide us. We can deal with difference and appreciate it. And if we have to agree to disagree, we, we, we disagree, <laughs> you know? But it doesn't have to tear us apart. And I know that seems maybe even Pollyanna-ish when, when you look at the conflicts that are, that are you know, tearing us apart. But there, is, there are ways of not falling into those traps. And I'm trying to live it, not just theorize about it, but actually live it, exemplify it. And if there are enough of us who do that, I think we can make it through. Yeah, there's so many pieces that I'd love to pick up on. The sure. one, I mean, I, I feel on this topic more than any other, mm -hmm. it feels kind of almost inappropriate to, to, to kind of foreground my perspective on it uh, as, an uh, as an outsider or someone well, from, yes. from, from England. But, but there is... But I'm, I'm sorry. You, you, American, you've opened... Yeah. But I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> but American culture and American civilization is largely derived from European civilization in Western culture. Mm. When we look at black American culture, people who look at that expression, black American through a racial lens, they're looking at just race. Mm. But when you go deeper beyond the, the, the surface of identity markers, you, you're talking about culture. So what are the tributaries that comprise black American culture? Mm. You have African you know, antecedents, there was an orientation where art was very, very functional in African societies. Mm -hmm. So we, that's something we carried over, where the artistic expression that we created, it was created in a very functional way here. And in fact, we influenced profoundly the music and dance of the United States, largely because of that heritage. But the heritage is also European. Mm -hmm. So black American culture is, has a tributary that's African, that's European. You can even say Afro-Cuban or Caribbean. Those are tributaries, but you still can look at um, a whole on that is black American culture, though it has tributaries. So it's its own mm -hmm. vibrant cultural reality, but it's not just about race. So you have a right, my friend, mm -hmm. because you have a heart a mind and a soul that when you hear black American music, mm. you like millions of other people can be deeply moved and can be influenced and inspired. So damn it, you have every right to opine on the impact on you mm. of Black American culture and Black American music. So I'm sorry, I had to disagree with you. <laughs> <laughs> and, give, and give me permission at the same time. Yes, sir. Um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I'd love in a second to kind of riff on that because I've been hugely impacted by Black American music. Like the vitality of American culture, I think, is so interwoven with yes. the Black experience and the Black tradition. Mm -hmm. And also, there's something really profound about. Some of the, the greatest music, um, some, I'm a huge fan of a band called Fertile Ground mm. from Philadelphia. 
And there's something about, and they talk a lot about kind of the, the inheritance of slavery, the kind of the mental prisons and the liberation of, a kind of internal liberation that I think is such a fantastic analogy for the spiritual awakening process. And that I think is an incredible gift, probably one of the most kind of profound gifts to the world is, and it's contained in so many different forms of American music. Big time, <laughs> big time. I mean, from the 19th century with the, with the spirituals, um, Ellison said that that was the, you know, the, kind of the first indications that here are a, pe this is a people, and uh, the first, you know, formings of the expression of, of, of our character. And the spirituals moved people. The blues, um, being more secular and starting off with, you know, the archetypal blues man, you know, with the guitar harmonica singing the songs and reflecting on the reality in the first eight bars of the blues, the objective reality of one's life, but having in the last four bars some type of quasi hopeful something, a resolution to the objective reality. It's in the form itself. And then, of course, you go to blues queens like, you know, Bessie Smith um, and others from the 20s, the, the blues divas, you know, they represent another aspect of, of, the, of the culture. And then you have blues idiom music, the highest form of which is jazz, which is a universe, a cosmos that we could spend hours talking about. But um, I would say that hip hop, you know, is, is, a, is a grandchild, you know, of the blues. So the blues is a form that has commentary on life, on one situation. Um, and so, though I would say rap um, is more florid, you know, than, than the blues, 12 bar blues, but there's, there are hundreds, not thousands of blues compositions that ended up influencing what became rock and roll, for example. So, so the blues idiom, blues music, is a foundation for most of American music. In fact, it's the foundation for gospel music, which is a, you know, dealing with the religious spiritual orientation. But Thomas Dorsey, the father of gospel music, was a blues man who wrote tunes and played with Bessie Smith and others, Louis Armstrong. So there's, there's this connection and cultural continuity. So the vitality of the culture is presented in the forms created by the culture where you can identify the values and the meanings of the individual who created them and, the, and groups who created them. And it's a living, breathing force. And because it's soulful, it touches the souls and hearts of other people. And then that's the way and people don't talk about this, and Ellison did. It becomes a way that we can influence and um, even impose our values on a society that socially, politically, and economically didn't allow that. But culturally is where the profound influence is. It's, it's a really interesting um, thought that in a way it sort of came through the culture through the back door. Oh, exactly. um, that was one of the the, uh, the main outlets. So therefore, it's sort of where where so much of the kind of the the genius, the the kind of spontaneity, the creativity was was funneled into that. Exactly. And, and then it had an influence that kind of pulled the culture in such a profound direction. Exactly. Even even if you look at the 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 British bands that the Rolling Stones and Led Zeppelin, they were students like huge students of Muddy Waters and like all of the, the kind of American jazz and musicians. Exactly. And yeah, the rock and roll was, was birthed from that. And obviously Elvis right. being the first kind of uh, white, white face on, on a black art form, effectively. The first major, yeah. <clears throat> but you know, Elvis, I mean, he loved gospel music. He loved the blues, he didn't deny that. But because, of, it's ironic, but because of, in part, 
how the society is racialized, you can take what's fundamentally, originally, forms created by black folks. But once you create an art form, the group who created doesn't own it. It becomes a gift to the world. So the problem becomes if one, a person says that they created something that they didn't, that's real appropriation. Or they don't admit and honor the lineage and legacy that preceded them that actually influenced them. That's problematic. But um, yeah, the vitality of the culture is the, the, the way we were able to not only express, but influence profoundly the world mm. in the 20th century and beyond. Mm. That's why I don't look at the idea that we are victims. <clears throat> We've been victimized, yes, but you can be victimized without maintaining a victim identity. You can be traumatized, but you can heal from trauma. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So, you know, this again, I'm, I'm expressing as a lineage holder, mm -hmm. I'm expressing this perspective, which did not start with me. I gave you a lineage, but you don't, you don't hear this particular because the, the way that media, the way that, um, we speak in our language, the way that race is socialized through racialization, and the way that conflict is the thing. Conflict, whether it's social media, whether it's local news. You, you turn on any local news in the United States at six o'clock, any day, they are not gonna start with a happy story. <laughs> they are gonna start with something crappy that happened to tap into your amygdala, fear. And so, so much is driven by conflict and fear that a more, um, a richer perspective, that's a lineage in American thought. It just gets papered over. And people in the academy, and this is one of the disappointments I have, you know, take Cornell West, for example calls himself a blues man, blues jazz man of the mind. But he knows the tradition I'm talking about. Yep, I know you do, Cornell, because we've talked about it. But he doesn't emphasize that. And he definitely doesn't talk about Ellison and Murray nearly as much as I think he could and should. But that's just my own opinion. <laughs> I, I just want to pull out something because I think you just gave a really fascinating and quite profound reflection on cultural appropriation because, and I'd say an integral perspective on cultural appropriation because I've always found the idea of cultural appropriation to be profoundly anti-human. Mm. The idea that mm. we're sort of, we should be kind of um, constricted to our own culture and in some way like, but I think what you just put your finger on is that there's a respect that right. if there's a respect of that lineage yeah. and that the problem is if people take things without uh, acknowledging where they came from and without paying appropriate respect to the lineage they came from yeah. and there is something yeah that 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 makes a lot of sense that if if someone is taking something from black culture and not acknowledging the the origins of it and and then that's that does yeah that does feel ethically and morally objectionable yeah. but taking something from this kind of gift, artistic gift to the world and, right. and building on it is, is part of the human journey. Yes, I mean, what, were Jesse Norman and Leontine Price appropriating Italian opera when they became some of the greatest sopranos in the world? Singing in 10, 12 languages and that kind of thing? No, they were applying themselves to an art form, apprenticing themselves to an art form out of love and devotion, and then developing their skills and their capacities to such an extent where they performed the greatest opera stages around the world. Nothing is foreign to us 
in our contemporary times. We have access. Andre Malraux has a concept called Museum Without Walls. I mean, through the internet, but even before the internet, we have access to, to archaeology, to, to all of human history. And we should find a way to look at the, the, the arc of human development and appreciate from where we've come and how art and culture exemplify the best of the human spirit and how one of the reasons that when politicians from particular areas, and I'm talking about, I'm not just talking about politicians, you know, uh, now or in the 20th century, I'm talking about going back to Greek and Roman times. You know, great ones like Cicero and you know, others, you know, they, they stand the test of times, but it's the art and culture that stands the test of time. And that's because within the art and the culture, it embodies the values and the meanings of a people, but that becomes a part of the human inherit inheritance and heritage. And you, we, no matter who you are, I mean, I could tell you, you know, some unbelievable, quote unquote, white saxophonists and trumpet players and this and that. You devote yourself to an art and to a culture and you, and you strive to play it and engage in and with it as if you were to the idiom born. When you speak a language that you're born into, you know, you, you just adapt to it because it's the, it's the language. Well, you can say that art and culture, there's a, an element of a vocabulary that you learn. And you can learn the vocabulary. And in, and, you know, in sports, it's the same kind of thing. So, you know, we have to broaden our and be more expansive in the way we see things and see the world. Because we live in, <laughs> in a time where being narrow is not going to do it for us. It's not going to take us forward. We have to really broaden and widen and deepen the way we see things and the way we are enacting in life with each other. You know, and that's, I'm trying to, using various ideas and traditions, I'm, I'm trying to you know, help broaden and enrich our discourse, to use a postmodern term from from Foucault and others. Mm. Greg, it's been such a pleasure to sit down with you. I really admire the way that, yeah, you, you're embodying the thing you're talking about in the passion and the, the lyricism of your words when you kind of, when you talk about this, so. Thank you, sir. I appreciate it, David.